So starting with avoiding misconduct. It's something like in clinical care, Peabody said, the secret of patient care lies in care itself. Similarly, when we are talking of avoiding misconduct, there isn't any secret to it, but to know what amounts to misconduct. And the greatest exercise would be to go back into one of our articles and do a thorough research for our own reflection to see to what extent we have copied, to what extent we have made a bit of tweaking. It is for nobody's information but for our own self. Because that, I would say, is a way of cultivating a integrity within ourself. So next slide. So I declared that I have no conflict of interest. And whatever are my viewpoints have been garnered through exchange of ideas and in the whatever has been as a part of publication. So, so types of misconduct, I'm very comfortable in saying that when you speak last, everybody has covered the ground. When I was in 11th standard, our professor used to say, this was covered last year and remaining will be covered next year. So to that extent, I can say types of misconduct which we're going to discuss are a bit covered, but of course I'll also mention about it. And why do they occur? Is again something that we need to go back in our own career. Were we denied promotion? Did we not have publication? Did we want to get at any cost a promotion? Did we feel bad? That why is uh, publication compulsory to get a promotion? I'm a very good teacher. I've trained so many people. I've even, let us say, counseled on time management, but why is this consi not considered? So when something is made compulsory, some people would resort to just for the heck of it a ritualistic way. So a lot of the misconduct is a story of each of us when we try to look at our own career paths. And how can they be mitigated because we are wiser now, knowing how retractions have occurred, how people have been penalized, how faces uh, feel that, okay, there is a loss of face for a particular person because of these things, so we will try to discuss about it. We cannot talk of conduct without bringing ethics into the picture. Otherwise, we'd only be talking about policemen who are regulating the traffic. But it's the conduct is self-regulated, for which we should have an idea, what is ethics? Is It is a knowledge of knowing right from wrong, good from bad, and virtue from vice. At a very basic level, in an elementary level, we say, okay, we know what is ethics. But what's important is it being put to practice. So at our level, we need to ask, what steps have been taken to put into research so that it becomes a robust research with authenticity and with integrity? So when we use appropriate value systems, as in case of ethics, when I say value systems, we need to remember value and cost, there is a huge difference. Today, even a five-year-old knows the cost of a Jaguar, but maybe a 30-year-old may not know what is the value of a relation. So that is why when we look at ethics, we also reaffirm our value systems. And when ethics is used in science, it advances human life. It's meant to be for betterment of human life. Having said that, we also need to take a look. In that case, it's one of the highest orders for the science good, good of life. But the tectonic plates, how they change, the science is also changing. So are the motivations and aspirations. And where then is the barometer of ethics in, uh, in relation to that? There is definitely a shift in the medicine, the goals of medicine. Have you accompanied your grandfather, grandmother sometime to a doctor? Please revisit it in your mind and remember what they would ask. I just want to get better. Somehow make me feel better. But today, from the restitutio ad integrum, that is restitution of our wholeness of body, we have moved on to transformatio ad optimum. We want to transform into an optimum level of being. It's not enough to just have my leg pain gone, but I must run the fastest. I must win the prize. 
So that is how the goals in medicine have shifted, and to make it available to us, the science has leaped forward. And then there's a change in the functions. So in healthcare, when we have changed our own uh, goalpost, the research, once upon a time, uh, it, no, a doctor, family doctor, used to make a concoction, try something again and give it, and one felt better. But today that doesn't work. If it's a research, it has to be validated. It's a research, it has to follow methodology. It should get published, which is peer reviewed, it should be generalizable and disseminable. So, a research doesn't stop at somebody feeling good by giving something, but even for that matter, output into publication. So, science and research, both of them improve the lives of people. And for that, when the research misconduct takes place, it's very important that the science, the bridge of trust with the persons, participants, should remain intact. So far, once the trust is broken, then it's difficult to bridge that particular gap. That is why once there is a mistrust, then with the researchers, participants, institutions, and entire regulatory mechanisms, there is a mistrust of people. So herein, we would like at each and every one of us when we look at research, look at it with a more authentic approach. You do a research, it may not count because it may have an insignificant outcome, but nevertheless, it's an authentic research and it has to go for publication because there is a realness in what you have done. But somewhere, we have changed our goalpost. We tweak a bit so that it shows significance. We tweak a bit because it gets published. But therein we realize that we are into a game of fooling ourselves. So when we understand how research goes in a way that does not support health of the people, we are not far from wrong in saying many of the papers get retracted, but they have also been the guiding principle in healthcare. For instance, in case of Joachim Bolt, who was a chair in anesthesia in Germany. He had nearly 160 papers on intracolloidal management of anesthesia, during anesthesia. People used to swear by his papers, and there were framework that was done, guide, guidelines that were done, how the uh, administration of the interparental, no, this thing should be done, colloids. But 120 of them turned out to be fabricated. That means, the experiment never took off, the research never happened, participants were never there, but this was all a fudged data. And when they were recalled, can you understand on whom it impacts? It was the patients, it's people, it's us, it's some of us, could be one of us. So this is where we should say, it doesn't hurt someone else there, it is not somebody else's problem, but it is our problem. I'm reminded of a small story which I got kind of garbled way, that once there was a poor man wanting to have a wedding of his daughter. And because he couldn't afford it, everybody decided he just needs to make some prashad and give everybody. And since he didn't have milk, the entire village said, we will get you milk. Each of them were asked to get a bowl of milk, pure boiled milk, so that they could make uh, to sanctify the marriage. And people lined up in an impressive way but only later on when you opened, you realized there was only water because everybody thought the other guy is bringing milk. It doesn't matter if I put in water. And this happens with misconduct when we think my one or two numbers here and there, how does it matter? It just doesn't matter. But such a paper, I have made 10 papers which is called Salami Publication. And then somebody who's doing a systematic review will multiply my sample size to 10 times and instead of 100, he will think, that I have done 10,000, I mean 1,000. So you can imagine how it hurts. So the fabrication, the falsification, especially when you try to shift the zeros and make it impressive, which is also called p-hacking. Somehow you have your p-impressive, that is the, you know, the, uh, the guiding principle for a research, and then conflict of interest. 
So this has already been covered by Dr. Nandini, so I won't go in detail. But it suffices to say when we talk of randomization, do we really do randomization? Or it is just about 10 people who come to the OPD and we say we had randomized the sample. 10 into 10, we make it 100. So somewhere, when we look at, we have done a study, it has to go for publication. When it goes for publication, we are in a great hurry to have it published because maybe the board is meeting next month and I must get it, so then I go to a predatory journal. I don't mind spending money, you know. It's as though we are sacrificing, but no, we are not doing science out there. Or gifting authorship to whoever is there so that we get, you know, uh, something in return. So these are some things one has to be very careful about. about I just would like to speak about the Wakefield, uh, the MMR vaccine, and the autism relation to that. Because when this paper came in Lancet, in a case series, and many parents were so impressed, wow, MMR vaccine causing autism, and that is why we don't want to give. The entire lobby of anti-vaccine grew, and it was only on sample 12. When they started retracting the cases, the other cases proved that it had nothing to do with autism. Autism was in a particular way, it was happening in its own incidence and prevalent rates. By then, it came only in a errata in a small particular paragraph which nobody reads. So lie travels around the world while truth is putting on the boots. So misconduct at publication level again, plagiarism, salami publication. So whenever we are writing something, the idea has to be our own. If we are taking somebody's idea, it is also idea theft, idea stealing. That's also plagiarism. And the authorship issues have to be settled much before you start your research. It is not that I've finished it, so I want to show who else will be on it, so that when they are publishing, they will put my name on it. So that is not right. In Wakefield case, it was also proven that it was funded by parents who didn't like vaccine, and there was a conflict of interest. So at all these levels, when you say, take any case study, and you see where it can go wrong, that is the way for us to correct ourselves. Whistleblower's role is very important, but I'm very concerned about how much protection do they get, because I think uh, Gurupur Madam also talked earlier that do we have that kind of justice system, a fairness? Do the eyewitnesses die so easily because they don't get a protection? So, but then the philosophy of whistleblower is great. We must encourage, and we should see that it helps the health of the people. And so in the end, I would like to say the guidelines are here to stay. And uh, if you follow them legitimately, like having a research integrity officer, we have one, and we do take some uh, complaints to him when it comes to especially plagiarism and publication and authorship issues, it gets solved. So in summary, stay true to scientific temperament and follow these steps diligently. Do not manipulate the data and choosing the right journal and avoiding the predatory publications. And do look for authorship guidelines. I have guided a lot of students, but many of them, when they send their paper for publication, I refuse authorship because I see on that bandwagon there are 12, 13 people, and I'm also one of them, whereas the study was only between me and the student. So we try not to get, encourage authorship like this, and we should also be sensitive about it and declaration of conflict of interest. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you. Any questions, I'll do.